Tonight's guest is my youngest one yet. Age 16, his development as a figurative painter has been exceptional. Starting out in his pre-teens as a cartoonist, he has now abandoned Donald Duck for Dostoevsky and Ab Nerdrum. William Heimdall, welcome to the Cave of Apollos. Thank you. Now, I can see that when you go from Donald Duck to this, the transition may seem like a clean break, uh, but we'll devote quite a bit of time to talking about your first true hero, the American cartoonist uh, Don Rosa. And what fascinates me about him is how his work ethics and his qualities are precisely what you would want as a figurative painter. We'll also be talking about your uh, latest show, which was a success and brought you to national attention. And um, I think we'll be talking a little bit about the documentary which is currently being made about you. Mm -hmm. But first, you don't fool me. You are a natural talent, right? No. No? No. Explain yourself. Well, there is no such thing as natural talent. Because really? how do you explain it? I have no idea. No? Me neither. So what's the solution then? Hard work. You must work hard. I was not born to be or born with the abilities to a cartoonist. Right. Uh, I was... Uh, it was my mother that... Uh, presented me to uh, Donald Duck. Yeah. I was around uh, eight years old or seven years old when I uh, got the uh, newspaper, the uh, Donald Duck magazine. Okay, yeah. In the, in the mail. Right. Once a week, every Friday. Uh, and I read these, uh, uh, these stories about Donald Duck and uh, <clears throat> I did this for a year before I got this, uh, this thick magazine exclusive. Uh, it was the first out of three parts from The Life of Scrooge by Don Rosa. Okay. So, uh, so, so that was quite a shock to go from these uh, horrible stories <laughs> to this grandmaster of, of Duck, Donald Duck. Right, and storytelling. And storytelling. And uh, we'll get to that, but I wanted to spend a little bit of time first talking about this self-portrait of yours. Or is this Nerdrum? <laughs> Uh, we were talking about this um, uh, in the Cave of Pellas team, how uh, at a certain level you're not really sure what is what. Mm -hmm. So some people might un misunderstand it as an uh, original Nerdrum painting because your, your development has be just been skyrocketing mm -hmm. the last two years. I mean, I think around 20, well, a couple of years ago, you really started to get uh, mastering the craft, started to be a classical figurative painter, and since then it's been quite uh, an amazing journey. Mm. But what are the actual uh, qualities that you try to convey in a painting? I mean, in terms of technique, in terms of storytelling, you mentioned uh, the bad stories in Donald Duck. <laughs> so what is a good story in painting? Uh, a good story is a tragedy. It's uh, a good person experiencing a tragedy. Right. Uh, so uh, I tried to put myself in this role, role as a poet. Okay. Because I'm a poet. I'm a painter. Right. And uh, so you <coughs> have, you, I'm sorry, you have a clear idea of the, the character, of the role. Yeah, I'm okay. a poet. Hmm. Because I have these papers underneath the plate. Right. Uh, uh, and uh, I want, uh, want myself to look 
as a good person. Mm. But the expression of the face is like the expression of a dog. Right. <laughs> a hungry dog. No food on plate. A poet. And uh, I must give, him, uh, give away my only, my last golden coin. Right. In order to oh, yeah. perhaps get some food so I can continue with the poetry. Right. And this, uh, this uh, clothing that nobody wears today. It's a bit more like rags. Yeah, yeah it's rags. Uh, so I want you to, uh, to have some kind of sympathy with, with this poet. Right. That's a good story. So now you're talking about the, the whole the narrative yeah. part here. So the, the, the idea of elevating the human is important for you. Yeah. And create uh, or um, uh, getting empathy from the viewer to the figure. Yeah. 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 This is I tried my best to make this man look as a man as he should be. Right. Better than any man. Right. You want to become this man. Right. But if you do, there is a risk. And what's the risk? You can be treated like a dog. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the typical reaction would then be, oh, but this is so depressing. Great. That's not an argument, obviously. <laughs> But what do you say to that? That's great. Mm. <clears throat> if you have a, an emotional reaction to this painting, I'm, I'm happy right. with that. Yeah. And then you, I mean, you mentioned also uh, too that the, this guy knows what he's doing and he pays to be able to continue doing it. Yeah, because it's a heroic act. Right, right. And it strikes me a, a fundamental difference between what you're doing here and in other works, which we'll get to uh, uh, of your works is that you know the typical contemporary figurative painting it's just a guy sitting there yeah. like this and you get this sort of it feels like it drains you everything is sort of depressed but you don't know why because the figure is just sitting there there's, there's no story explaining why should he be, de be depressed mm. so when you see a painting like this or a, or a, uh, for example, uh, uh, Two Tongues by Odd Nodrum. Mm. I find that much more optimistic <laughs> uh, image because there's a, a lust for life there. There's a will yeah. to live. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, you want to help this man. Right. You want him to, to be elevated, to not be treated as a dog. Right. Maybe you start to think... Uh, how how are poets treated? Right. Am I seeing poets as what they are? Uh, yeah, because uh, Jesus was treated in the same way. Right. He was hated by his contemporaries. Right. But later, after his death, uh, people began to love him. Maybe we should uh, give this man a little bit of pleasure before he dies. <laughs> That'd be good. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, in terms of, of uh, painterly values, I mean, you've obviously learned a lot from studying with uh, Ad Nerdrum. And, but you studied with his son, Ode Nerdrum, yeah. first, or how? Explain Well, that. I, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I was too young to study with uh, Ad Nerdrum, uh, but uh, I had the opportunity to study with uh, Ode right. during the summer. Right. And I did that. And uh, I think I've never learned so much anytime. Right. That's what I did uh, during the summer. Right. Uh, so my focus became better. I learned how to prepare a canvas, how to treat the model, and a few tricks to get this and that effect, because the kitsch painter deals with effects. 
yeah and uh, great conversations okay so uh, what i see in your work is uh, a fundamental necessity for creating a drama or creating a three-dimensional form mm. it's the way you dissolve the form mm. you are not caught in details right mm. and uh, there's an f- interesting thing that that uh, you see also with rembrandt and i think if you understand that you come quite far as a painter that he he would paint your hand as he sees it while looking at your face mm. So he doesn't copy everything that he sees, but he paints the way the eye would see the person. Mm. And this is what, you're, what you've been doing here. Yeah, I tried to uh, paint this man as, uh, as how the eye can see. Right. So it's not a photocopy. Right. Because... Uh, Have you ever painted from photo? No, never. Never. Uh, because uh, <coughs> when you paint after a photo, it doesn't look like people. Right. It looks like photos. <laughs> <laughs> I want these people to be people, not photos. Right. So, so I, I try my best to paint after what I see in the mirror. Uh, so I paint that. And also I look at other paintings to see what... Uh, other painters has done. Right. And in this painting, I was uh, heavily influenced by Nerdrum. Yeah, because he's made these self-portraits with the plates yeah. uh, there. Yeah. So, so you have no problems at all with this typical problem of originality? No. Well, that depends. The public expects originality. Right. I hate ori- originality because it's impossible to reach a complete originality. Right. Uh, Ayn Rand talks about that. The that philosopher. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, that if you were to, to invent a new color, you would be unable to see it. <laughs> <laughs> this would require a new sense organ. It's impossible right. to make an orig- original color. Right. So what's the point then? But you can paint man better than man. Mm-hmm. Man has he should be he should be, and this is this I learned from uh, Ayn Rand uh, from the Romantic Manifesto. Right. Yeah, and I was presented to these books uh, during my time as a student of mm. Öde, mm. and that was very helpful. Right. Now I know what to do, what to strive for. So in other words, I mean, we'll, we'll get to that a bit later, but yeah. to, uh, to reveal the answer now, you think it's important to, to read? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so you're working with a very dissolved form here. And I was thinking, uh, is there, do you, do you think there, there might be a problem for you I mean, if you look at Adnerdum's development, who went from you know, very loose to you know, very tight, to very loose, you know, I mean, put very simply, mm. uh, went through Car- the sort of the Caravaggio school. Mm. Do you think there's a, a there might be a problem for you there if you don't do that first? Uh, it might be a problem, but it's possible to paint uh, in a loose manner. Right. I mean, the young monk, monk, the yeah. monk. Uh, but uh, he got crazy and began starting as normal people. Right. Uh, so I might uh, try. Well, he was crazy, became normal. Yeah. yeah, he was crazy, became normal. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I might uh, begin to paint like Caravaggio a bit later. Right. But I want to uh, to try to paint the room before that. Right. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a uh, nice goal to have, uh, and and uh, also when you work with these, um, this kind of a really 
coarse, rough, um, uh, foggy, but still foggy way of, of painting. Uh, you work with color next to color, almost of the same hue, but they're cool and warm. Mm. And you can still get lines there. So, I mean, in that sense, it might not be a problem at all because it's not like you're not drawing at all mm. in this type of, uh, type of work. Yeah, uh, but I think it's nice to, or very helpful to try to paint like Caravaggio. Right. Because then you know how to paint like Caravaggio and Nerdum or uh, Titian. Right. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's much better than knowing only Nerdum. Right. You have two options. It's not that Nerdrum is uh, any worse. I think he's the best to have ever lived. Right. But uh, the more knowledge you have, the better. Right. Yeah. Uh, there's another thing too I wanted to hear your opinion about. The idea of painting movement. Yeah. Because you're obviously concerned with that. Mm -hmm. how, how on earth do you do that? Oh, that's hard to describe, but <clears throat> uh, if we can compare that to how the cartoonist Don Rosa does it. Yeah, yeah, well, that's a good segue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's this uh, s sequence in uh, one of his stories about uh, the Flying Dutchman or something like that. Uh, but uh, they are in the desert, desert, desert and uh, and uh, Donald, he, he grabs this, uh, this bird <laughs> by the foot. Like, and the bird flies away. Donald is still holding the, uh, the foot. Right. And uh, the bird is angry at him and flying through this, uh, all of this cactus. So the bird is over the cactus and uh, Donald is getting all the pain. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, at the end he's totally covered with needles and he's very tired. Yeah. And uh, but he's still holding the bird. <laughs> so the bird takes his beak and picks on his head yeah. like this. Uh, and you can see that the head goes like this. Right. Because he selects certain parts of the face of the, or the head of the bird and repeats it. Yeah, yeah. So here is the, the head. He can take, for example, a detail of the eye, draw it like this, 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 over each other. Yeah. So you select certain uh, important parts uh, that you can still see. Right. So if you look, look at me, my eyes now, mm. and I move my, my arm like this, yeah. you can still see sort of a photographic effect. Yeah, it, it's, uh, the, the um, movement is still in your brain. It's like the hand yeah. is, is still there. Or yeah. yeah. So, uh, so to try that, to do that in a painting. Yeah, and Nerdum has also done that in uh, the Golden Cape with this man running. Yeah. Uh, he's having his foot over some water. Yeah, stepping into the water, the, uh, yeah. the old man. Uh, yeah. And you see his uh, foot here, and in the water the reflection is a little bit behind. Right. So the foot is like this. Right. Yeah. Right. So he selects some important parts uh, from the foot that you would see uh, if you saw the foot in real life. Yeah. And he paints that. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, Nerdrum also does it in, it's a very good example, the um, uh, Tourette with yeah. the fingers there, where you can see the, the finger, well, like this several fingers or, or the, 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 the shadow image of it. Yeah. It was there, but now it's here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, you have other uh, duck cartoonists mm. when they, for example, uh, draw a dog 
that uh, has just uh, taken a bath, trying to shake off the water. The, uh, the ears will fly around together with the head. What Don Rosa would have done is to take some parts from the ears and repeat that. Right. But what his contemporaries does is to draw the entire ear. No. So it becomes 14 ears. <laughs> <laughs> and that's partly why he's so much better. Right. Yeah. Before we get into um, more about Don Rosa, what was the first reaction when you saw him? When, what struck you with Don Rosa? Oh, it was a story. Storytelling. Storytelling. Also the technique. Because uh, he is so much better. Uh, uh, it was, yeah, I got this, uh, this magazine in my uh, mail. It was in the middle of the summer. And uh, it was in the, co the front page of the magazine was a drawing of uh, uh, the young Scrooge, the uh, 10 years old Scrooge, in front of a uh, horse, a running horse, with uh, a knight riding the horse. Okay. There was no one in the armor, but it was just the armor in flames. Right. It's, oh, my God. That was such a shock. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you can see he, uh, he must have looked at Caravaggio because it's composed. If you draw a cross, right. you can see that uh, it's clearly he must have done something in order to get this composition. Right. Because it could be the composition to a painting. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so it was a story about uh, Scrooge MacDuck, yeah. Donald's uncle. Uh, he was, this character was not created by Disney, Walt Disney, but Karl Barks. Yeah, right. Uh, Don Rosa's. Uh, idol or master uh, and uh, it's 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 a long story he spent one and a half years making it uh, drawing it uh, and it's entirely based on uh, what Karl Barks has said and right. written about uh, this duck right and he's not afraid of admitting that, Don Rosa. No, he's it's uh, from what I've, I've uh, read, uh, Rosa is, is uh, quite clear that it's uh, unthinkable for him to base a story on anything else but Karl Barks. Mm. So again, there you have a, a connection in the terms, way of thinking, the whole ethics that, uh, that uh, Originality is completely out of the equation. Yeah. Uh, Don also doesn't think about originality at all. No. He completely dismisses it. Yeah. I mean, he makes continuations of or, or precursors to <laughs> yeah. Bark stories. Yeah. Uh, and he even has this dedication uh, in the, the, first, the first box. Yeah. with uh, all these characters. D-U-C-K, dedicated to Uncle Carl from, from Kino. Kino Don Rosa. That's his full name, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so he, he is very clear on what he's doing. Right. I have not made up this. This is not original. This is completely based on another story. Yeah. I have continued on this story or, uh, or uh, made it better yeah. in a way. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, I think he also, it, it was the story that gripped me about uh, Scrooge. It's so shocking because it's a heroic journey. The hero's journey. Yeah. Yeah, it is. 
he is this oh, why is it to explain if you can, can explain yeah, that yeah yeah uh, he is he grew up in scotland in the end of the 19th century uh, he was poor uh, his father worked in uh, a mine and for his 10th birthday he got uh, uh, something to clean shoes with yeah, shoe polish uh, yeah. equipment. Yeah, shoe polish equipment. Right. He, uh, Scrooge, 10 years old Scrooge, uh, goes out to the street in order to make some money. So he, uh, he doesn't reach any success at all at first, uh, but his father stages an event. Uh, he pays a worker uh, an American cent, is it? Yeah, I think so. It's, that's the, his first yeah. coin. Uh, and he says to this uh, worker that, uh, hey, ask my son to, uh, if he can polish your shoes, you get this, pay him this, this coin. Mm. And so he does. Uh, and uh, he he spends a long time on polishing the shoes because uh, he has been working for years. Uh, and he passes away when he's done with polishing the shoes. And finally, he gets his uh, his silver coin, and then he wakes up. Right. After this, uh, well, yeah, he faints. Uh, the, uh, Scrooge, yeah, faints. Yeah, yeah, and uh, the worker goes away. He wakes up, and he's angry because it's not uh, Scottish money. Right, it's American. Right, and he gets angry, and he says that uh, I will never, never be fooled uh, again. I want to become uh, tougher than the toughest and smarter than the smartest, but honest I will be. Right. And that's the beginning of Scrooge's life. Right. Yeah. And then there are, to make a long short story, not too many successes in the beginning, oh. but then he succeeds. Oh yeah, he becomes this rich capitalist hero. Right. <laughs> yeah. But that is amazing then when um, so, so that, that's the narrative part of it. <clears throat> You've always been drawn to narrative, not just... I mean, Rosa is clear about this himself, that <clears throat> he doesn't just want to make strange stories because this, these are ducks. Yeah. These are uh, more or less human figures for him, as, uh, as far as I understand. Mm. And, and, um, and what they do shall be, has to be realistic. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, and he has this uh, story about uh, Kalevala, yeah, the from Finland, yeah. based on a myth. And uh, at the end of the story, uh, it's this giant frog coming <laughs> out, out, out from the water, and his this it's enormous. It's so huge, but it's so realistic. Yeah enormous frog and he's flying up to the sky like uh, if that was completely normal <laughs> and uh, and this frog he gets to the city and destroys everything and it's completely realistic yeah. everything this is something that aristotle talks about right i was thinking about that yeah yeah, that uh, uh, you can paint something uh, that's impossible to happen in real life, so-called real life. But as long as it's well done, it's okay. Right. Paint whatever you want. It's the same thing that happens in um, in uh, the late version of The Prodigal Son by Rembrandt. Yeah. The guy standing there to the right, if you follow this anatomy, he doesn't have, either he doesn't have a torso he doesn't have the whole le uh, whole thigh yeah it's missing <laughs> yeah yeah and if you look at uh, Rodin the sculpture sculptor 
uh, he makes the the hands and the feet much larger right in order to the, the figures to look uh, better right so if you look at uh, uh, the hands the feet of Titian they are horrible <laughs> not big enough no what the hell I would that's I wish he could have painted the feet and the hands uh, bigger. Uh, Nerdrum has done that. Right. And hooray for that. What, so, okay, so specifically, what does that do? W w what is the advantage of doing that? Why, why should you enlarge the hands and feet? <laughs> well, that's to, uh, to make... It, first of all, it looks more beautiful. Uh, I'm not sure, but I think Nerdrum has said that if you stand by a Rodin sculpture, you will look like a monkey, <laughs> but the sculpture will look like a human, right? Because it's so beautiful, right? So uh, the, the red thread here, when it comes to Don Rosa or if it's really Rodin or if it's Rembrandt, is that it's emphatically not naturalism. Yeah, because it's nature as it should be, right? And could uh, be. Then you're back to Aristotle again. Yeah. Right. And you have that, uh, if you compare uh, Don Rosa to Karl Barks, and Don Rosa and Karl Barks to a photograph of a duck, right. the duck is duck as it is. <laughs> and uh, uh, Karl Barks is duck uglier than duck. Right. And Don Rosa is duck as it should be. Right. <laughs> so, okay, so Barks is comedy. Mm -hmm. The actual duck is, well, it's a duck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you have Scrooge, who is the uh, heroic character. Yeah. The tragic tech character. And that's the thing. That struck me. You mentioned Kalevala. That is a thing you... I might be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's a thing you don't really see in other uh, dog cartoonists. This melancholy, mm. the whole ending there, where yeah. it's like, a, okay, let's just leave all this money. I want to sit here and play, and this is how I want to spend my life. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they hunt for this uh, treasure that produces gold. Yeah. And uh, Scrooge gets it. But he wakes up the Finnish go uh, gods, right. and the gods take uh, the uh, the treasure back. Scrooge loses the treasure, and it's this wonderful sequence in the story, mm. where Scrooge has to he uh, holds the treasure, and you see that he cries. This old man that has strived so much. I'm getting goosebumps. This, I, that's an amazing moment. Yeah. And then he has to give up because yeah. he's not as powerful as the god. Yeah. And you've been talking also about how Don Russo compared to, okay, again, the rest, you know, Don Russo is best forget the rest. <laughs> uh, how he basically makes timeless dramas. Explain that because I mean, of course, there are there's a certain time period here, but uh, but still, you're you're saying that this is uh, a timeless timeless stories. Yeah, because it's he bases his uh, stories on uh, myths, right? As the Kalevala, and you have a clear archetype. It's the hero's journey, yeah, Scrooge's life. Uh, and uh, there are no mobile phones. Right. No. Yeah, that's the worst phones. thing. There's Donald Duck there sitting there with the computer. Yeah, I remember that uh -huh. very well when I was eight years old. That I was so disappointed by the Norwegian <laughs> Duck magazine. Always these phones and iPads. Always. Why? The story becomes so boring. 
I couldn't. It was so un interesting. So I, I remember I wrote a letter to the Scandinavian publisher, Egmont, complaining about the bad, bad stories in the magazines. That I wanted more Don Rosa and old stuff without fonts because it's better. Yeah. Please listen. It's better. Why is it better? Because it's timeless. And because uh, uh, fonts are ruining this, the entire Western civilization. So you have that paired with his. This is, on this goes together. I mean, what differs, uh, separates him, uh, Don Rosa, from the others is that the characterization is so realistic. Oh, yeah. It's not just, here's a funny guy, here's a funny guy, here's a funny guy, here's something you can recognize in your daily life just to give, uh, uh, just to satisfy the viewers. I mean, he really is more concerned with creating a good story yeah. than being popular. Yeah, and what's so amazing. And that's made him popular. <laughs> yeah. What's so amazing about uh, Don Rosa is the example I gave a moment ago hmm. when they were looking for this uh, treasure in the desert. Yeah. Because Donald Duck is a duck, it's a bird yeah. grabbing a bird. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't realize that. Uh, yeah, well. It's a man grabbing uh, a bird. Right. When right. you look at Don Rosa. Yeah. 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 Uh, if I'm not mistaken, there are also situations where they eat eggs for breakfast. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, um, but but this is this is fascinating. Uh, <clears throat> how uh, a doc cartoonist has one signifier after the other that you can find in Aristotle or in Rembrandt or in these other things. And one specific thing, <clears throat> I remember I, I read, I think it was in one of those, um, I mean, you have this, this Hall of Fame books. Yeah. And, and he makes this, uh, this um, short, uh, not essays, but short explanations in front of every uh, episode. Yeah. And he talks about how he, he is most happy when he can have a story that goes through one day. And mm. I'm thinking, do you know what I'm thinking about in Aristotle? Yeah. Uh, Explain he, yourself, sir. Yeah, uh, he says that an epic tale can continue forever for many months. Right. But the tragedy should end before the sun sets. Right. One day. Mm. And that's the, what uh, at least later was codified as the uni unity of, of uh, action and, and time and place. Mm. I guess this, these three things. Yeah. Right. But this is what, <laughs> this is what Ibsen is, is doing too. Yeah. Yeah. It's simply the best. Yeah. There's another a uh, story that you start to read at a certain point yeah where you got the book with some illustrations yeah well uh what happened right before that is that i uh, i began to make my own uh cartoons right based on don rosa okay yeah and i uh, i uh, made a story that can only be understood in norwegian about uh, uh, a kind of bread, uh, and I sent it to uh, the the Egmont publishing, uh, uh, yeah, company, yeah, publishing company, uh, because it was a drawing competition uh, annually, right, and I got accepted together with uh, a colleague named uh, Mikkel Hagen, right. Uh, and I, he became my mentor, more or less. Great. And uh, he, I think he, uh, he was m much better than Karl Barks. He's quite shocking to look at. Uh, he had this story about uh, Scrooge uh, and uh, Donald and his nephews going to this old hotel 
to sleep over and uh, by the hotel it was this uh, lake and uh, uh, in the lake uh, they lived uh, there was a cave by the lake and in the cave uh, there lived uh, some scary monks <laughs> uh, and I that shocked me right. to to see this man it's a few years older than me right. but it's really shocking to to see his uh, his stories uh, so I got in contact with him and uh, uh, we uh, drew and uh, made stories together, or separately. But mm. and uh, the next year, after we both were published in this duck magazine, right? Uh, we sent another story right. to uh, to the competition. None of us were accepted. They only accepted uh, these horrible uh, illustrators. Right. And I remember uh, both me and him were so furious at this uh, Egmont company because it was so horrible stories. And both of the us... The narrative had, was... Yeah, both the narrative and the drawing was art. It was so art. Modernist. Uh... Yeah. Uh, and uh, we got extremely angry. And I, uh, I think I wrote a letter to Egmont, complaining about all of this shit going on. No reply. I stopped subscribing to this uh, duck magazine. Uh, uh, and uh, we, I, I thought that uh, drawing ducks became so meaningless because it was no hope for the talent in uh, Duck. Uh -huh. Even in uh, Donald Duck, no hope. Uh, so, uh, this man, Mikkel Hagen, he introduced me to, uh, to Tolkien, Lord right. of the Rings. Right. And uh, so I said to my best friend at that time, uh, where I lived, this is not the same man. Uh, you know, I want to see the movies to the Lord of the Rings. I was around uh, 13, I believe. 10, between 10 and 13. Uh, and we uh, had this... Uh, he came to my house. He slept over to me. We were watching the Lord of the Rings. No, it was The Hobbit at first. Okay. Uh, but I, I I read the Hobbit the book first and was very dis disappointed about the movies. Okay. But then we saw the Lord of the Rings and that was regular shock. Right. And uh, so I decided to read uh, the book books as well. And I read them uh, three times. This that was year. a big thing for you. Yeah. Uh, I read. The three books separately at first, at the beginning. Uh, but then I uh, ordered uh, uh, this uh, big book with all of them uh, together. Right. With illustrations by uh, Alan Lee and John Howe. Okay. That, oh God, that was so shocking. Uh, you can call that my uh, first... Uh, introduction to to kids because some of these uh, il illustrations are completely mad they are so great you have this illustration of uh, the big mountain and you can really see it's watercolor uh, and uh, you see this enormous mountain going up to the skies and continuing big black painting. <laughs> uh, so I decided to buy some drawing material because I thought that uh, oh, painting is so hard, I don't want to try that. Uh, so I began copying 
uh, John Howe, especially. Yeah. Uh, and also Alan Lee. By the way, did you ever copy Don Rosa? Oh yeah. Uh, I yeah, I remember I searched for him drawing live at uh, on uh, YouTube. Right. And I was sitting there for hours looking. Setting on uh, uh, on pause, drawing, continuing, repeat, <laughs> and I drew this cover many times. This cover right. uh, with this proud uh, heroics uh, duck, many many times until I I thought I reached his level, but I didn't. <laughs> so I so I began with. Uh, with uh, Lord of the Rings. Right. Alan Lee, by the way, has got uh, a very nice illustration by of the orcs. Okay. They are having this large hands, big hands, long nose, and uh, this they are wearing these gray rags, thin rags. Right. And on uh, top of that, they have. Uh, old armor and uh, they are in this cave holding a, a torch lightening up the ca cave it's so amazing yeah so I, I I began trying to draw trees because I saw uh, John Howe did that mm -hmm. he were he was exceptional at drawing trees what really appealed to you then was, I mean, what you're describing in the cave, the torch, uh, and this fight and all these things are basically timeless stories with archetypical figures. Mm. That's what... Yeah, and that's, I, I think that's why I, I went from uh, drawing these uh, duck cartoons to uh, to try to paint like the masters, right? Not necessarily the old masters, because we have many masters today. Uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing. <clears throat> By the way, a lot of people uh, say that before there were great masters, and now everything is gone. Yeah. And then they perpetuate that modernist myth that, uh, which which basically becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. If you don't focus on the good things made today, then no one will know about it. So, yeah. Okay. So okay. So, um, but but when do you get into painting then? I was thirteen. It's uh, almost three years ago. Right. And uh, and my mother, she showed me this uh, painting uh, class that lasted for a weekend right. uh, in a town nearby my uh, my home, and I wasn't really sure about if I wanted to go because I thought that. Uh, uh, illustrating uh, Lord of the Rings mm. and uh, uh, Duck. Mm. was the way to go. Mm. I knew about uh, the Mona Lisa and uh, the sick child, but not that it was possible to do that today. Right. It was... I mean, you didn't consider it a, a, no, as I, an option? No. It was... No, I, I didn't know about it at all. Mm. I did not know that it was anyone that... I didn't know that uh, Odenurgem existed. Right. I didn't know that uh, that uh, the Pieta by Titian was existing. Right. Uh, but at last I said, yes, I will go. So I brought this illustration of uh, Gandalf smoking mm -hmm. his uh, big long pipe. Uh, I think it's drawing by Alan Lee or John Howe. Alan Lee, I think. 
I wanted to make a copy of that. Mm -hmm. And so I did. Not a great copy, but uh, okay. Very bad, actually. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, the woman that uh, held the class, her name is Monica Helgesen. She was a student of, of Nurm. Right, I know. So uh, she said, uh, you should really look up Odnerum at the internet. And maybe you can come back tomorrow and paint a copy of one of these paintings. Uh, so I, uh, when the day, first day of the class was over, we went uh, to the hotel room. Uh, I uh, searched for Odnerum. And uh, the first painting that really gripped me was Twilight. The shitting woman. Mm. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. I wasn't, I don't think I was laughing or anything. I was so gripped because he has made, made a shitting woman look attractive. Yeah. And that's really amazing that you can make shitting look attractive. Hello, shitting, attractive. So uh, I was uh, scrolling through the page, looking for more paintings. Uh, and I came back to the, uh, the class the, other, the next day and I decided to paint a copy of uh, uh, a portrait by yeah. Nerdrum, Amo. And I did. Mm. Uh, so I came back to my home, uh, I bought more painting material, started working on a copy of uh, Rembrandt, um, and uh, it looked like it turned out as a portrait of my great grandmother's brother, because they look very similar. <laughs> Uh, and after a while, I made a self-portrait from the mirror, not from photo, as uh, a soldier with uh, this, uh, it is more or less the same clothing as this. Right. Uh, with my, uh, my eyes closed, like uh, gaping. I think I saw uh, the self-portrait by uh, Nerdrum before painting that. Uh, and that was my first self-portrait. Right. And you never even considered photo? No. Was that conscious or...? No, uh, no. No? I don't think so. Uh, but uh, I have tried to draw out from photo before. But it's so boring. Yeah. Uh, I have always preferred to have live models in front of me. Or uh, other drawings or uh, paintings. It reminds me of what, what uh, Don Rosa says, that he's always found drawing tedious. Mm. He likes storytelling. Mm. <laughs> so he has to go through drawing to get to the story. Exactly, right. yeah. yeah. And after a while I, I made a portrait of my sister. It uh, went fine. And I made another uh, copy of uh, Nerdrum. Mm. Um, and uh, later I, uh, I, I discovered the uh, kitsch philosophy. How? Oh. It was the uh, woman that was responsible for the class. That, Monica Helgesen. Yeah, yeah. I saw she posted some photos on the internet with a hashtag kitsch something. Yeah. I was really curious about uh, what the hell is kitsch. So I searched for it on the internet and it was said something on Wikipedia that it was mass produced, uh, low quality art, all of that. Uh, and, uh, but I. Half a year after I attended the class, I uh, well, visited my grandmother and we went to a bookstore just randomly 
and I saw Kurt Morgen art. Really? And that was behind another book. So I had to <laughs> take the book away. Is there something interesting here? Oh, let's buy it. So I bought it. I didn't understand much because, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was uh, just pause a second there. Um, were you at that time aware of the situ whole situation, the art world, the, the you know the typical stories that you hear of people having gone to art schools? They want to learn, but they, at best they don't learn anything. I mean, did you know about situation for figurative painting, all of that? Yeah, I think I knew about uh, Norwegian artist, Sverre Bjerknes. I was talking shit about Hitch. Uh, I did not want to become like him. I was very clear on that. I wanted to become a painter. Yeah. And I did not want to make art. I never considered myself as an artist, even when I made uh, duck cartoons. Yeah. But I was very clear you that... Clear that you were a craftsman? Uh, yeah, not artist. Do not call me an artist. Because uh, art is like Picasso, the old Picasso. Yeah. Uh, I, I was completely different from those people. So you were aware of these, those issues before you came across Nordrum, before you came across uh, Kitchmore and Nord? Yeah. I knew that uh, Jackson Pollock was an artist. I was not like Jackson Pollock. Right. It was obvious to you. <laughs> yeah. Why the hell should I have the same title? as someone that's doing the complete opposite of myself. So you, you were never convinced with the idea that Rembrandt would have done like Jackson Pollock in that time because art shall reflect its time and these things? No, oh, I was uh, very interested in uh, making great things and making great stories. Hmm. That was my concern. Yeah. Not to be uh, original and be an artist and be a Right. part of the group because uh, I've always been an outcast. Yeah. Okay, well we, we've been talking about this, but but to make it clear what made you choose to go down this path instead of illustrations proper or or cartoons. Uh, because the painting the paintings I was exposed for were, were they 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 fulfilled Aristotle's uh, goals right. in order to make a painting. Therefore, I think that was that gripped me because of that. And it's, it's fun. I Had you read Aristotle at the time? No. No. I, I was just thinking. It's, so, it, in a way, you could say those are not Aristotle's goals, but Aristotle describes a basic human. Yeah, right. Uh, but I, uh, I remember that. Uh, I was a little bit confused in my value system. Okay. How? Uh, now I, I, I didn't really philosophize about painting at all. What I knew, I knew unconsciously. Right. I had gotten it in uh, from the people I was surrounded by. And luckily I was surrounded by wise people. Right. <laughs> So uh, uh, I remember I took the test, are you a kitsch person or an artist? <laughs> okay. Before I read Aristotle. And I remember I got uh, two answers from that, uh, uh, that test was Kantian. Art. Yeah, art. And I was so up upset after that. <laughs> was very disappointed. And the first thing I did was to buy uh, the poetics and read that. That's amazing. Mm. That's amazing. Mm. Um. <laughs> wow. Um, so it, it strikes me that throughout, you know, the different uh, phases of your long career, uh, 
you've always been, I mean, you, you went for Don Rosa, you didn't go for whomever else whose name I don't know, uh, who's just a mediocre cartoonist. Mm. You see a lot of doings, these illustrations, if you stick to drawing now, and the eternal qualities there, or the situation that is depicted, which is also what you saw in Don Rosa. Yeah. The whole ca caves, torches, mm. it's not a new thing for you. No. Uh, but uh, I, I belong here. Uh, in the kitsch tradition, right? Because it's more gripping, it's more timeless. Uh, it deals with archetypes, uh, and uh, people are moved by archetypes, of course, mm -hmm. uh, and they are executed in a better way than uh, ducks. Right. Yeah. More well, quite simply, more realistic. Yeah, yeah. you can see yourself in kitsch in a way. Uh, for example, uh, when, uh, when I uh, make this uh, painting of uh, Sebastian Salva mm. uh, as Raskolnikov, it's a man with a gun. Mm. He has just killed the uh, uh, old woman from the uh, Dostoevsky novel, Crime and Punishment. And he's holding this gun. Mm. And he's running away from uh, two people with uh, two large guns and a dog. Uh, and uh, and you should see, in a way, see yourself in that painting. That uh, this man is good. He's being chased by two people yeah. and a dog. He's only one. They have got uh, two big guns. I have got only one small. Uh, so they get this sympathy yeah. with this man. Uh, and uh, people tend to uh, have sympathy with good people. You don't sympathize with uh, ISIS soldiers. You sympathize with good people. Therefore you think that uh, this crazy uh, murder, Raskolnikov is good because you feel sympathy. Right. Uh, and uh, as Karl Korsnes, the philosopher, talked about, uh, and our Aristotle, people tend to think, to, to see themselves as good. Right. <clears throat> and uh, the characters in the paintings are good, good people. So they recognize them, themselves and think that uh, I might become this man, good man. But if I am not aware of where I put my feet, I can become a murderer. You can become, you, you would like to become the good in him. Yeah. But you also see at the, at the same time what could happen if you do not follow that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can become this man. But this man is good. Yeah. And he has done something horrible. Think about how you treat people. Are you paying a uh, rent to an old lady that you don't like? Do you think you should kill her? You might think so. I do. But be aware, you can become as desperate as this man. Right. You can be chased by two, by society and a dog. And you must, and then you have to hide people will find you. You will not get away. Mm. You see he has uh, got blood on his mouth uh, because uh, he has been hit. Uh, and that's sort of a punishment for what he has done. Right. Yeah. And it's a strange situation then where you look at the painting, <clears throat> identify with the good person, and then find out that you're not as good as you thought you were, and you're trying to become what you thought you were in the beginning, mm. <laughs> when first seeing the painting. Yeah. <laughs> so, to you, uh, painting a story is not some indifferent thing. 
I mean, there's some there's a, an ethical, uh, strong ethical component there. Mm. Yeah, uh, I think uh, this is something I learned from Ayn Rand that uh, uh, a good piece work of uh, kitsch is supposed to give you a moral option right uh, and uh, and even the horrible by uh, Ilya Repin is a great example right you see this uh, man killing his son and the facial expression is crazy it's so shocking Mm. Even if you see it on a computer scene, you, uh, screen, you will be shocked. Mm. It's so gripping, mm. and you will think unconsciously. Will not you will not literally think that I might become this man, but in your uh, unconsciousness you will think that I might become this man. Maybe I should think about. How Metaphorically speaking, yeah. In some way. Uh, maybe I should think about how I treat my son. Am I good enough? No, I'm not good enough. I can become this man mm. uh, if I don't change uh, my uh, my moral structure. So uh, therefore, I will set up a list of goals. Metaphorically speaking. And uh, I will unconsciously try to reach these goals. That's why painting is important. Right. And so, given the, then uh, that you're obviously uh, inspired by Nordrum, but also Caravaggio, Titian, but, but very clearly of Nordrum, I guess you've heard... What about your voice? Yeah. What about it? <laughs> yeah, I think it's very nice. Yeah, it sounds good. Uh, but in paintings, you, you you should avoid your own voice. Why? Because it's impossible to reach a complete own voice. If you have that as a goal, you will look like everybody else. Right. If you uh, show a monkey a snake, the monkey will be dead afraid. Mm. It's in their blood. Yeah. Uh, and if you show a man, uh, a woman with a red dress, the man will uh, produce more dopamine than uh, what he would do if he saw the same woman in a blue dress, right, right. a green dress. Mm -hmm. It's in our blood. Yeah. Uh, but it's... If you go to a... And, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, and because th this goes in a completely different direction than originality. Originality is, I choose this on an island. I live on an island by myself and I choose this. Yeah. What you're saying is that there are certain things you do not choose. Yeah. You do not choose to be gripped by kitsch. Right. You should be... Uh, you should... Uh, what you say... Uh, you, Ayn Rand talks about this, that uh, you are moved by kitsch without doing an effort, something like that. Yeah, but, but then uh, uh, some would say, or you, you could argue, well, if it's, if it's one thing you could say about Ad Nordrum, it is that he is fundamentally original. You have never seen those images uh, this compilation of sticks, hoods, uh, the expressions, the, the that, those type of stories uh, with airplanes suddenly in the midst of all this or a wheelchair or so. You haven't seen that compilation of, of um, things in a, in, a, in a painting ever before. So he's fundamentally original and you have to be original to be a great master. Ha! Gotcha! No. What? No. If you look at, at uh, Hertwig, you have the clouds. 
if you look at uh, Titian, you have the technique, the loose manner. If you look at the stories, you have everyone. Right. <laughs> That's a good answer. Yeah. You can compare it to uh, uh, trees. If you have one seed to a tree, mm. plant one here, mm. go five meters the other direction, plant one there. Mm. The seeds are identical. It's the same structure. Mm. Wait for 10 years. Both will become two beautiful pine trees. They look different, however, in their form. Mm. But you can clearly see that it's pine trees. Right. Is this <clears throat> the same thing as... Um, uh, I, I mean, not everyone's been concerned with uh, how do you translate that? Uh, so the original myth, but not the original in the art sense but the, the fundamental myth mm. the the myth before the myth and uh, i think also joseph campbell talks about it how there is well that's i guess it's the seed of your your uh, story there there's the seed and it grows up in different uh, soils mm. and what comes above the ground looks different if it's buddha or jesus or whatever it's the same thing but it's it, the the local coloring is different yeah right yeah, it's the same with, yeah, exactly. Uh, you, you have, uh, you have uh, Isola mm. uh, from the 80, 80s or so, mm. where it's completely taken or imitated. Uh, he has imitated Hartwig, no doubt. Mm. But you can see it's an urdrum. And uh, Aristotle talks about this, that uh, uh, it doesn't matter what kind of uh, voice, let's put it that way, it's told in, but it has to give the same effect. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's change the topic slightly. I mentioned in the beginning your last show. This was, uh, I think, what could be considered uh, quite a success. You're now, you've been uh, gotten to national attention. And it's so funny because I, <laughs> when I do painting courses, they say, oh, have you heard about this young man? Uh, he's so serious. And he paints so wonderfully. <laughs> it's like, oh, you, you wouldn't by any chance be talking about William Heimdall. Oh, yes, I saw him on television. <laughs> How was that uh, show for you? It was very stressful. Right. Yeah. Because you're still, you're still in school. That, that's also a thing. Yeah. Uh, but it was very nice to have people coming to see your paintings. Uh, for example, what really shocked me was that I exhibited this uh, self-portrait with closed eyes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, a woman came walking in and she began crying after looking at that painting. Not because I'm so young and blah, 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 but because it was well crafted. Right. And that's so amazing when uh, people are dare to be pathetic. Right. <laughs> Not to have a distance relationship with what you are looking at. Right. How many paintings did you exhibit there? And when was this? It was last year, in uh, the end of March. Right. Uh, eight paintings and two drawings. Right. And is this show, uh, 
was it because of this that the whole thing about the documentary came into being? Because it's being currently being made, right? Yeah, it was. I think it was because of this. Okay. Yeah. So tell us about that. What what did they say? Why did they want to make a documentary about you? Yeah, I don't know why they wanted to make a documentary about <laughs> me. Because I'm very boring. I don't like people. Right. Uh, I hope them they decided to make a documentary about about my paintings. Right. Because of my paintings. Mm. Uh, because why be concerned with people when you have peop uh, paintings that is better than people? Right. Why be concerned about me when you have this? Right. No point. Always look for the best. So in this documentary, <clears throat> you're concerned with uh, re um, directing the focus at your work. Yeah, because I think my work is uh, important. Mm. Uh, I think one of the reasons for why the the West is going down uh, is because of the lacking culture and religion. Uh, you have the example with uh, the the Raskolnikov uh, portrait. If enough people were open to paintings, did not have a relationship to paintings as paintings, but actual people. As stories. Yes, yeah, stories. Scenes not out, yeah. not a canvas with some paint on. They would be able to to have this catharsis and and uh, and make their their goals into becoming better people people. Right. And when one people one person do that, he will become a better man. If many people does that the entire society will become better. Right. It always starts with yourself. Now, I know you have an issue with this also when it comes to the school system, because mm -hmm. this plays into what you're saying now. So it's not a different topic. It's just build, uh, building up under what you're saying. Yeah. Why is it a problem with the current school, school system? Brainwashing. What? Brainwashing. Brainwashing. Yeah, uh, I get so depressed when I look at all this. Uh, it's my entire generation. Mm. They do not think. Uh, some people has to make the rules and uh, uh, and the rules for what they are going to learn. Mm. Uh, and these people are obviously sitting in the garment. Yeah, and uh, the government in Norway is is completely socialist, and uh, I think the socialists are the worst when it comes to 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 hating Kish. I will explain that later. Yeah. So these people make the rules for what uh, the entire population of Norway should should think. Teachers uh, uh, teach that to uh, the kids. Kids agree, yes, yes, yes. And uh, you know, you have this character system. If uh, when you have a test, you get, uh, you must answer that and that and that to get to get uh, a point. You know, right. Uh, and I remember. Uh, once that I had a test about population, that the population must be stopped because it's increasing and it will get too many people. Uh -huh. uh, and I said, no, I don't agree with that. Can you, can you prove that, please? I have some arguments. I put my arguments. Uh, I link the source, a uh, great video about uh, by uh, Hans Rosling, the Swede. I don't get a point on that test. Right. 
uh, but we have history. What do we learn in history? We learn about uh, the Stone Age, and then we jump over to the uh, after the Industrial Revolution. Right. Nothing about ancient Greece. Nothing about the uh, the Roman empirical uh, period. Nothing about the uh, Middle Ages. Nothing about the Renaissance. Nothing about the great times of the West. Right. But if we learn about uh, a little, little bit about uh, uh, ancient Greece, we learn that it was an evil patriarchy and blah, blah, blah. And uh, if we learn about the Renaissance, we learn that uh, Martin Luther was a great man and blah, blah, blah. Next, next period. Right. Industrial Revolution. We don't learn anything about uh, about uh, Apelles or no one. But how about, I mean, we were talking a lot about storytelling, myths, mm. archetypes, mm. religion you mentioned. Mm. What about that? Yeah, I have a communist teacher supporting Bernie Sanders. Uh, he is uh, thinking, he thinks that the Bible is a fairy tale. Right. And he said that loudly to class. Right. Or, yeah. Uh, and we learned that people believing in uh, this uh, horse shit is fanatics. Right. They, they believe that uh, there's a man with a big uh, white beard up in, the, in heaven and uh, Jesus walked on water. Of course, people, you know, how about the religion, religions from ancient Greece? How about the Dionysian religion? Mm. It was great. Well, the problem is here that we learn uh, only the fanatic part of religion, not the. Uh, you, you mean that you learn that religion, religion is only fanatism? Yeah. Only negative? Yeah. With the Crusaders and uh, a little bit about ISIS, but not so much. Right. Nothing about the archetypical aspects. Nothing about why has Judaism existed for over 3,000 years? Why is the Grimm brothers' uh, stories over 10,000 years old? It must have some psychological uh, influence. Right. Because if I tell you that, uh, uh, as uh, Leonardo DiCaprio says, that climate change is real. Right. You will not believe that. He must explain it. Right. Not just threaten you. Yeah. So, this, when you're talking about then, what you learn about religion, yeah. and this is by, by extension myth archetypes, um, you learn that it's completely superficial, superfluous, it's not needed at all. Yeah. And is, is this what you mean when you say that it's, the, the school system is run by enemies of kitsch? Yes, partly because of that. Right. But we also learn uh, about uh, Islam. What do you learn? It's a great religion, friendly religion. These people are uh, refugees, refugees. Take them in, pray for them. What we don't learn is, is that 52% of uh, Muslims living in England today think that uh, homosexuality should be punished by death. Mm. We hear nothing about that. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. And you have uh, uh, a limited uh, freedom of speech. You cannot draw Mohammed, even if you're a Christian. 
Just take a look at the Charlie Hebdo uh, massacre. Right. They drew a caricature, very bad caricature of uh, Mohammed. Shot down. Right. And is the point you're making then sort of the same as Marcus Anderson was making, that if you silence freedom of speech or freedom of thinking, mm. then that has a strong negative effect on culture. Yeah, because uh, you you have to think, of course, uh, what these uh, students are are focusing on is to be right, not to seek truth. Right. Uh, it's impossible to change their minds. Impossible. They attend school from they are six years old, go to school for 10 years. They have to choose whether or not they will continue for another many years. If you don't, if you choose to not uh, continue, you are lost. So you have to follow this uh, public path in order to get your license mm. to as a proof of being a good citizen. Right. Um, and uh, what's so shocking in all of this is that is the uh, of course the uh, banning of uh, making. Uh, representations of of uh, Mohammed or a, any living being actually right. in uh, Islam, when they are presenting this religion as uh, entirely good, they don't look at well. They 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 didn't focus. They didn't say a word about what happened in Morocco. But when. Uh, when they, the, this horrible man attacked the mosque in New Zealand, mm. everyone was talking about it. Right. One of my teachers were so close into showing it, the video of this man shooting all of these people mm. in the classroom. Right. To show, show how white people are mad and Christians are stupid and blah, blah, blah. I would uh, agree at a certain extent. extent. And uh, look at the Norwegian money and compare them to the ISIS money. Right. Not a single face. Mm -hmm. they, are, they have switched out the young Edward Munch with whatever. Right. In a horrible way. This artistic, very artistic way. This reminds me of what um, I learned about the Greek Dark Ages. Mm. When that whole situation, you know, the, the culture went down, there are several factors that, that, that played into it. But what they're saying is that this, the, the, the product that they made, went from showing the human figure and going down into abstract patterns. Mm. This is what you're describing here, more or less. Yeah. So is your situation that of um, Mark Twain then? He said, first part of my life I got an education. I went to school. The second part of my life I got, I got an education. Mm -hmm. I mean, where, yeah. so where do you learn things then? You read yourself. Well, I uh, read books. Right. Uh, when I studied with uh, Odo he we talked about uh, Aristotle and uh, and uh, Dostoevsky and uh, Bulgakov, mm. and uh, we we wasn't forced into reading this stuff. We had to do it by our own interests. Right. Uh, so the last summer I read uh, the politics by Aristotle, uh, and I must say that it was a great satisfaction to 
have a little revenge on the social justice movement. Okay. Uh, because he's very harsh on women uh, in that book. <laughs> uh, I think that's, and, and slaves. I don't think he really thought that, but that's not interesting. It's a problem, however, when we learn about Aristotle in school, that uh, they say, oh, he hated women, he supported slavery, he married a slave. Right. You could be punished by death if you opposed slavery at that time. Right. Uh, but enough about that. Uh, so I read, I read, uh, and uh, I learned how to read when I was four. And to, yeah, and to write when I was four. So I always read. And uh, I have always looked at great literature. Don Rosa instead of Barks, and uh, yeah, and uh, Aristotle instead of Plato. Right. <laughs> yeah. So what you're saying is, at the end of this, what? I would say, think, read books, uh, become wise. Think, don't think of the fact that it's paintings, but it's stories. Read both sides of the situation, and you 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 will suddenly realize that it's it's you have an option, an option, because you don't have that today with this brainwashing in schools, where uh, Christianity is the devil and so, and uh, also be very open to other ideas. Listen carefully to what people say. Uh, and uh, dumb people learn from their own mistakes, but uh, smart people learn from others' mistakes. That's a good way to end. Yeah. William Heimdall, thank you for coming to the KO Palace. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you for watching. Remember, you can support our channel at caveofpalace.com. I'll see you next month.